Shahnameh Stories, Part 2 The Story of Hu Shang and the Black Deev When he heard that the Black Deev had killed his son, Kumas's world turned dark. Heartbroken, he staggered down from his throne, fell to the ground weeping and wailing and tearing at his clothes and flesh in abject grief. Cries of sorrow arose from the land as the armies wept with him, and even the birds and animals joined in anguished cries of mourning for their lost prince. And as the king grieved, so did joy leave the world and sorrow reign. But after a year of mourning had passed, the angel Surush appeared. The time has come to turn sorrow into revenge, he said, and told the king to rise, gather his army, and relieve his grief by ridding the world of the vile Ahriman. It so happened that the slain prince had a son called Hu Shang, who was as handsome and brave as his father and highly intelligent. He had been lovingly brought up by his grandfather, who now told him of his plans to take revenge on the Black Deev. I will raise the armies and accompany you into battle, Kumas told his grandson, but I am tired and old, and so you must be their commander and lead them into battle. And what a magnificent army it was. The whole realm and all of God's creatures came together to avenge the death of the slain prince. Paddies, angels, birds, wild and savage animals such as wolves, tigers and lions, as well as the tame, accompanied the courageous soldiers and all charged into battle led by the fearless Hu Shang. The bold black deev advanced, but this time he and his demons were no match against the magnificent army driven by a father and son's fury and vengeance. Having crushed the horde of demons, Hu Shang caught the black deev, cut him in two and sliced off his grotesque head. He then threw him to the ground and skinned him. There are approximately 30 known and some quite dramatic illustrations of this scene. They vary considerably in their depiction of the battle and the ultimate fate, character, and even color of the Black Deev. This painting, dated 1441, and therefore of the Timurid period, is one of the earliest. And as you see, despite his name, the Black Deev, Divesyah in Persian, has been painted brown. The moment of the killing is set in front of a mountain. As if driven up by the rage for retribution, the rocks mushroom up into a pyramid peak directly above the head of the rearing horse. They then descend as Hu Shang's sword comes down upon the Deev and as described by the text, slices him in two. Groups of soldiers, angels and demons peep anxiously from in between the craggy boulders whose small craters give the illusion of circular spying eyes. The movements of the rock faces give the impression of a hierarchy of spectators inquisitively discussing amongst themselves. The liveliness and excitement of the painting is further accentuated by the loud squalling spirals of clouds taunting each other from either side. The drama is in fact so exciting that it has burst out of its frame into the left margin where propelled by a pirouetting ribbon, an angel swoops down, grabs a fleeing demon by the scruff of the neck and brings him to his knees. At the center, the beaten and battered black deev flops on the ground legs sprawled out, raising a submissive hand. On his comical, multicoloured face, 
the once brazen salivating tongue and menacing eyes droop in capitulation as the dying div and those hiding at the top watch the emboldened fox jeer at the fallen monster's blood raining down his chest. Although this is a horizontal slice across the div's body, elsewhere we shall also see the more dramatic vertical blow where villains are cleaved in half. In a similar scene painted in India one and a half centuries later, the black div is again painted brown. The noise and clamor of the drama come from the variegated leaves of the frazzled trees that lean across from the top right of the painting to pointedly argue with the neurotic branches that twist from the rocks and shout back. Odd-looking multicolored deeds look on in confusion as they are caught up in the commotion and get a sound scolding for good measure. In the top right tree, the dark pink div's uncomfortably wide straddle mirrors the black div's sprawl in the foreground. While the soldier's gestures indicate a measure of apprehension and surprise, it is as usual the shock of the upright red flowers, the alarmed crab-like scampering away of the leaf feet just under Hu Shang's raised right elbow, and the spikes of the twigs shooting out of the cactus-like bushes that create the atmosphere. Similarly, the Black Thief's defeat and Hu Shang's victory are symbolized by the two serpent heads. One, a fizzled out last puff from the Thief's tail. The other, the victorious hiss of the red trident tongue of the one poking out of the banner. In another unusual manuscript, the black div is painted a spotted dark salmon color. The eerily silent scene is set in the aftermath of the beheading. At the top of the painting, clouds and rocks draw back to reveal five human looking multicolored div heads with very long noses. The white div among them is singled out by his horns and his shoulder that points their gaze to the gory double scene below. There, framed by the tilted crowned heads, another white div with long regal whiskers and eyelashes lies in a pile of twisted and chopped off limbs with a deep gash on his head. Below him, in the foreground, encircled by bursts of startled leaves and panicking white flowers doing their best to flee, lies the freshly decapitated Black Div. While his arms and legs continue to flail about, the head has rolled away to his feet and to the dismay of an outcrop of flustered bluebells, stopped to stare at them with its wide open eyes. There is little indication of the furious battle that has just taken place, except for the agitation of the horses, as the soldiers, including the frail white bearded Cumars, arrive on the scene. Standing over the div's corpse, Hu Shang's pristine clothes and calm and groomed demeanor belie the fact that he is the warrior who has just decapitated, cleaved and skinned the son of Ahriman. More representative of the narrative is this painting from another exciting manuscript at the Golestan Palace Museum in Tehran, which shows Hu Shang in the thick of his wrestle with the Black Div. In this action-packed, chaotic and heated battle, leopard skin attired soldiers, myriad animals and three peculiar looking bright blue and purple divs look on amidst the whirlpool of rocks, clouds, birds, trees and banner 
that swirl in and around the central action. The imagery is closely tied to the previous story. The leopard skin clothes hark back to Siomak and the idyllic reign of Kumars before the advent of evil. It links Hu Shang to his slain father by replicating the violent single combat in which he had lost his life, but reversing the outcome. The lower windswept part of the central tree to which the blue deev clings emphasizes the force of the encounter, while the awed expression of the two deeves underscores Hu Shang's strength and victory in retribution. Notwithstanding the numerous paintings of vanquished thieves, as we shall see, they are often, and increasingly from the 16th century onwards, depicted with a broad range of emotions and depth and treated as the worthy opponents that they are. Here, for example, far from the grotesque creature that we have seen, the black deev is depicted as one would imagine the formidable son of Ahriman. Tall and elegant, his bestial qualities are kept to a minimum. Sporting a flattering long leopard skin tunic that sets off his brawny body, his impressive physique and bulging muscles are accentuated by the understated bands of gold. Most striking of all, as he looks out directly at the viewer, the gold of his flaming eyebrows casts a light into his blazing, penetrating eyes, giving us a glimpse of that distinct trace of humanity that is at the center of our discussions. But as expected, the most exciting, entertaining, and creative illustration of this scene comes from the most illustrious of all Shahnameh's, the Shahnameh Shahi, also known as the Shahnameh of Shah Tahmasp. There are five extraordinary deep paintings in this exquisite manuscript, which we will discuss at great length throughout these series of videos. And each is breathtaking in its exuberance, humor, an astonishing humanity. This folio has been painted by its most supreme artist, Sultan Muhammad, whose court of Kumas we looked at in the previous video. Its text gives the full background of how this battle came to pass, including details of the magnificent army and the furious battle itself. Although in most cases, the text on the illustration describes the scene depicted, and indeed in the process of manuscript production, the calligrapher wrote the narrative first and allocated the blank space for the artists to fill in. In this instance, it is stopped short of the capture and killing of the black div that is the very subject of the illustration. That part of the story was unfortunately separated from the illustration when the manuscript was broken up by its former owner and many of the folios dispersed. That destructive act and its deplorable implications that will be discussed separately and at great length is on stark view in this example. As with all Persian manuscripts, the text on the illustration is only a part of the narrative. The rest, and in this case, the dramatic conclusion that takes up two thirds of the page that faced it when the manuscript was intact, is hidden behind the painting entitled The Feast of Sadeh at New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art. Nevertheless, can a vicious and bloody battle with such a gruesome end, have been painted with more delight and invoke more enjoyment and laughter? With light-hearted humor, Sultan Muhammad has transformed a gory battle of vengeance against evil 
into a fun scene where the deeves have become objects of ridicule and naughty rascals being severely punished. Their grotesque characteristics are magnified into caricature, leaving no element of the sinister that is not counterbalanced and mitigated by their playful foolishness. The whole painting teems with energy. Beneath a golden sky filled with swirling clouds, somersaulting cranes and swaying trees, a mauve landscape cradles several dramas between bright green vegetation and effervescent pastel-coloured rocks alive with spirit faces. At every turn of the eye, different figures and clusters create arrays of arabesque form where each sweep of colour and movement is echoed, mirrored and dramatised. In the anti-clockwise motion that circles up and around Hu Shang killing the black div, two lions and a spotted turquoise div entwine in a complex wrestle. The mid-air leap of the lion to the right, defying spatial logic, complements the upswing of the one beneath, nibbling away happily at the div's ankle. Caught up in a most uncomfortable and exasperating situation, the elegance and harmony created by the upward and downward swing of the lion's bodies underscore the distortion of the div's tangled up limbs. Above them, in trapeze mode, two angels carrying rocks swoop down to throttle a worried white div. Warned by the large, hairy, grey div behind him, the muscles of his back and legs tense through his translucent white skin. Leaning on a twisted arm, he draws back in fear, raising a weak, wobbly hand to deter them, as the plant in front of him covers its head with its branches and also braces for impact. To the left of the painting, the Deves, who had been rather enjoying the spectacle in the company of the Coraline Rock spirits, now stare in alarm as the branches in their midst wave frantically at the blue Deve bouncing tauntingly away from the drooling leopard in hot pursuit. Shaking a chiding finger at the leopard, his slanted eyes glint over the blue cheeks that ripple out in mirth as he backs distractedly into the clamouring crowd. The long, stealthy strides of the leopard menacing the blue div are duplicated in the lunge of the fox above him as he rushes, mouth salivating, towards the cowering white div. In the foreground vegetation, a div gasps under the energetic pounce of a leopard that has just landed on him with a thud, its head thrown back in a triumphant roar. Behind him, caught by his tail that has been humiliatingly wrapped around a tree and is at great risk of being cut off, the pink div raises a lethargic arm to put a stop to the rather odd game that seems to have taken a dangerously painful turn. The noise and energy of the foxes and leopards accentuate the listless plop of the black div at their centre. Around him, agitated plants lean in to get a good look as Hu Shang, who has straddled the div and holding him by one ear, slits his throat. His head tipped forward, the various paraphernalia of royalty in Hu Shang's crown draw attention to the prima donna peacock headdress of the double flowers perched on an elaborate skirt of leaves. The languid expression of the deves and the furrowed brow of evil intent is offset by the expanding ripples of their mouths which in the work of Sultan Muhammad plays up their air of cool confidence and roguish nonchalance. 
Within this marvelous array of zany characters, he gives each div individuality and a psychological profile of their own. Be it the pink div's forced yellow buck tooth smile lodging a formal protest against the removal of his tail, which judging by its decorative gold band he is rather fond of, or the ferocious black div who scratches his head in contemplation of his own beheading and accepts his fate with resigned boredom. In the next video, we will hear the story of how Hu Shang's son, Tahmures, subjugated Ahriman himself and became known as the Div Binder, Tahmures Div Band and in return for sparing their lives, made an unusual deal with the Deves.